At its peak in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the Persian Arabian Gulf supplied 80% of the world's naturally harvested pearls. Pearls from the Gulf once dominated the world market, and pearling dominated the Gulf. Contemporary surveys implied that up to 95% of the capable male population in Qatar worked in pearling. Then in 1916, a businessman in Japan invented a way to produce a perfectly round cultural pearl at industrial scale. His work annihilated an industry half a world away. In this video, we look at the Gulf pearl diving industry and Japanese cultured pearls. The Persian Arabian Gulf includes the waters off what is now Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. The people there have been pearling for thousands of years. We have archaeological evidence of pearls and pierced pearl jewelry in Kuwaiti sites dating back to 5000 BC, so the pearl might perhaps be the oldest gem known to man. Random cuneiform tablets aside, Greek writers writing at about 400 to 100 BC give us our first concrete mentions of pearl fishing in the Gulf. The Gulf experienced its first real pearl boom, however, thanks to the Roman Empire. Julius Caesar is said to have paid 6 million sesterea, or about $650,000, for a single pearl as a gift. And who can forget Cleopatra's bet with Mark Anthony that she can eat a meal worth 60 million sesterea, or $6.5 million. She is said to have won the bet by dissolving a pearl in a cup of vinegar. Wonder what she won. Many of these Arab cities grew wealth by bridging east and west, trading goods like pearls to the wealth centers of the Indian Ocean. Bahrain was, and for many years, remained the largest. In the 1400s, the total pearling fleet numbered a thousand ships. In the 1500s, the Portuguese and other European powers colonized the cities of the Indian Ocean. The colonizers moved the old trade routes, cutting out the Arabs from their former livelihood. The Arabs were relegated to simple agents, or distributors. Margins were tight, with profits flowing up to the European capitalist companies. The decline in the trading business, combined with shifting trends in Gulf politics, enabled the rise of new pearling centers outside of Bahrain. Like Jolfar, a city but north of the modern city of Ras al Haima in the UAE. By the 1700s, the pearling economy had grown large enough to support population centers otherwise unsustainable without it. In the 1800s, the British entered the picture, crafting the local society to their taste. At that time, the leading marine power in the region was the Al Qasimi, an Arab Gulf dynasty with some 500 ships. Their traditional trade routes to in the Indian Ocean clash with the European colonial companies. The British, seeing them as mere pirates, went and fought two campaigns against them in 1809 and then 1819, which they won. The subsequent preliminary treaty signed in 1819 disassembled the fleets, except for those meant for pearl fishing. So part of the reason why pearling in the Gulf eventually became so dominant was because that was what the Europeans allowed them to do. Let's talk a bit about how pearling worked. The waters of the Persian Arabian Gulf are shallow and quiet, but also warm. That is why they are so ideally suited for large beds of oysters. Diving happened basically whenever the waters were warm enough to dive into. Traditionally, that spans about four months of the year, but by the early 1900s, the season had split into three distinct phases. First, we have the cold dive, or the Gas al Barid. These take place in mid-April or May and last for about 40 days. The waters are colder at this time, so not every boat does it. Then we have the Gas al Kabir, or the Great Dive, where most of the boats are going to be at. It starts in early June and ends in September. A local emir would appoint an admiral who sets out to the sea banks with his clan of boats. The journey would be christened with ceremonies. The banks are communally owned, so the fleets can choose whichever one they think might have the best oysters. There are 271 charted pearl beds around the Gulf, but most captains keep the locations of their favorites only in their heads. And these beds move around. They might be empty one year and lush the next. Once they are at the pearl beds, the divers clamp their noses shut with a special clip made from turtle shell or sheep bone. They then dive about 15 meters or 50 feet 
to the seabed with the aid of weights tied to their legs. Once at the seabed, they harvest oysters, putting them into bags tied around their necks. Naturally, the divers don't have any breathing equipment, so they hold their breath, sometimes for up to four minutes. It was a hard job in which some died. Once their time is up, the bags and divers are hauled up to the surface by people on the boat. The diver rests for a few minutes and then goes back down. On a good day, a diver might make about 50 to 60 dives, sometimes up to 100 even. The oysters are left overnight to weaken and die. Boy workers then open up the oysters in front of the divers to prevent fraud. At the end of the great dive, the boats return home over the span of three weeks, the Arada or return. This is marked with great celebration. The pearls are purchased on the spot by merchants. The merchants then ship them to what is now Mumbai, India. The pearls might be sold to people there, or shipped to Paris, London, New York, and the rest of the world. Pearl divers then do jobs like agriculture during the off-season. Finally, divers who suffered a bad harvest or have a strong tolerance for chilliness might go back out to the ocean again for a final cold dive. New trends in the second half of the 1800s helped set the table for an unprecedented boom in the gulf pearling industry. Pearls have always been popular in Europe because of their beauty and shininess, which are said to signify sweetness and purity. But as the middle class gained more disposable income, they wanted to wear more jewelry to signal their wealth. In France, the Empress Eugenie of France wife of Napoleon III, started wearing colored pearls. She then triggered a Paris fashion trend. Pearls became a sign of legitimate taste, quote, quote. The Parisian jeweler Leonard Rosenthal said that the pearl necklace became one of the surest warrants of bourgeois dignity. This European middle-class demand just added on top of existing demand in India and the rest of Asia, leading to a world pearl boom. Pearl-bearing mollusks can be found all around the world from Mississippi to Scotland to Ceylon to the Red Sea, but the Gulf most benefited from this pearl boom for several reasons. First, Gulf pearls themselves are quite nice. They are multicolored, yellow, pink, blue, so on, which very much appealed to French tastes. And their luster holds up better when rubbed with skin oils. Second, competing pearling markets in British Ceylon and the Red Sea were hit by external factors. Ceylon had a series of natural disasters, and the Red Sea was beset by pirates. So in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the Gulf had a near monopoly on natural pearls. Prior to 1870, the entire Gulf pearling industry generated revenues of about 1.4 million rupees. In 1873, Bahran generated 1.4 million rupees by itself. The southern Gulf states of the modern UAE were earning 1.1 million rupees a year. Gulf pearl exports, which the British tracked in terms of value rather than quantity, due to the nuances of pearl trading, then more than doubled in value from 1873 to 1902. In 1908, the English diplomat John Lorimer published the most comprehensive survey of the gulf pearling industry. By then, the gulf economy was completely dependent on pearl fishing. Pearls were 75% of the Arabian Gulf's total exports. For four months of the year, the towns would be empty of physically capable men. An estimated 4,500 boats and 74,000 people would come out to sea from both sides of the gulf. In some years, that went up to 80,000 people. A stunning 50 to 70 percent of the male population of the Gulf was connected to the pearl fishing industry in some way or form, if we are to believe Lorimer surveys. The local government and governors derived some 60 to 80 percent of their income from the pearl trade. This incentivized them to protect the industry from foreign interference, and they also attempted to regulate it to prevent overfishing. In 1877, William Palgrave recalled how Sheikh Mohammed bin Sani, his son, would go on to found the modern Qatari state, said, We are all, from the highest to the lowest, slaves of one master, Pearl. Pearl diving was a difficult life. By the late 1800s, many of the workers on the boats were migrants. 
These migrant workers have it especially hard, to say the least. Individual pearl divers are paid for the pearls they harvest, minus living expenses whilst on the boat. Because most divers don't have the money up front, they borrow it from the boat captains. Captains, in turn, borrow from the pearl merchants. Captains and divers who suffer repeated bad pearling seasons end up seeing their debts grow, praying for that one beautiful pearl season to save the day. If that season never comes, then their property, and even family, can be forfeit to the lender. So the entire gulf pearling industry, and the people in it, depended on borrowed money, a perilous situation. Worse yet, they were chained to it via debt, indentured servitude. Pearls are beautiful and worthy of kings and queens, but the costs of getting to them are high and wasteful. An exploitive industry involving predatory debt and the deaths of many oysters, and occasionally a few people. A sad situation. The ancient Chinese people dove for pearls too, searching the bottoms of big freshwater rivers for pearl-bearing mussels. This was an extremely dangerous job. Many divers drowned, froze to death, or were attacked by river creatures. The hardships motivated Chinese scientists to find ways to artificially produce pearls. The ancient Chinese people of the 11th century Song Dynasty are the first people recorded to have artificially created pearls from mollusks. You take a large freshwater mussel and put it into clean water. The mussel would then open its mouth, which gave you the chance to put a bright and shiny fake pearl into it. After that, you wait, frequently changing the water to keep it clean and keeping the mussel under moonlight during the night. After two years, you get a pearl. Notably, the Song Chinese inserted little Buddha sculptures into freshwater mussels to create what are now called blister pearls. These were treasured art pieces that the Europeans tried to copy, but could not. The Chinese honed this technique over the years, and a small cultivated pearl industry sprung up. Chinese pearls were said to be vastly superior, and you can hardly tell them from the real thing. Great, right? But Chinese cultural pearls suffered a production problem. In the 1700s, the French Jesuit priest François-Xavier de Entrecoles detailed the process. This is long, but bear with me. It's a gem. Ha ha. In a basin, one half full with fresh water, place the largest mussels obtainable. Set the basin in a secluded place where the dew may fall thereon, but where no female approaches, and neither the barking of dogs nor the crowing of chickens is to be heard. Pulverize some seed pearls, such as are commonly used in medicine. Moisten this powder with juice expressed from leaves of a species of holly, and then roll the moistened powder into perfectly round pellets the size of a pea. These are permitted to dry under a moderate sunlight, and then are carefully inserted within the open shells of the mollusks. Each day for 100 days, the mussels are nourished with equal parts of powdered jingsen, china root, pecky, which is a root, and pecho, another medicinal root, all combined with honey and molded in the form of rice grains. You can see why Chinese artificial pearls did not take over the world. The process was artisanal. It was, in part, modeled on superstition. Like, why can't women, chickens, and dogs go near the basin? And it cannot easily scale. We have long known that natural pearls come from foreign objects introduced into the oyster's body, which it then coats in a substance called nacre, or mother of pearl. The question was what that thing might be. Traditional folklore in the West claimed that oysters, or mussels, created pearls when touched with a drop of rain, or dew. This was accepted for many centuries. I don't know why. In the early 1600s, both the Flemish naturalist Anselmus de Boot and the Portuguese explorer Pedro Teixeira pointed out that the pearl in the inside of the mollusk's shell were made from the same thing. They suggested that the pearl was the result of a disease in the oyster. In the early 1800s, scientists cut open small pearls and found tiny particles about the same size of oyster eggs. This led them to theorize that pearls came from oysters' own excreted eggs. Other scientists noticed that oysters often suffered parasites. 
In the 1850s, the scientist Filippo De Filippi of Italy obsessively studied freshwater mussels and concluded that pearls originated from such parasites. Throughout the 1800s and early 1900s, the parasite theory grew to dominance. Even today, Wikipedia makes the claim that most natural pearls originate with parasites or intruders into the mollusk. The problem with the parasite pearl theory is that it is hard to mass-produce cultural pearls with it. In the early 1900s, entrepreneurs started various business ventures implanting parasites into poor oysters to make pearls. These all failed. Kokichi Mikamoto was born in 1858 to an udon shop owner. When Mikamoto was 11, his father fell ill, so he left school to sell vegetables on the streets. Later on, he switched jobs to become a seafood merchant. He did this well enough to become appointed chairman of his local marine products improvement association. Japan's natural pearls are produced by Akoya oysters, which can produce a fine pearl of high value. But in those years of the world pearl boom, the oyster population suffered massive overfishing which was sad. So Mikimoto decided that there might be an opportunity in pearl oyster aquaculture. So in September 1888, he began experiments in Tohoku Island in Ago Bay to produce perfectly round cultural pearls. In 1890, he was introduced to Professor Kakichi Mitsukuri of what is now the University of Tokyo. From Mitsukuri, he received a complete education in the history of oyster culturing in the West. As it turns out, natural pearl formation is a bit more subtle than just the parasite bumbling into the oyster. The pearl oyster starts producing what will eventually become a pearl when it suffers an injury to its mantle. The mantle is the oyster's most external organ. It lines the insides of the shell's valves and encloses the oyster's soft organs and tissues. Now, this might come because of a foreign irritant like a parasite like a tiny crab that has gotten into the space between mantle and shell, or a grain of sand, a rock, broken shell, or so on. However the injury comes about is ultimately irrelevant. When the oyster senses the injury, cells from the upper layers of the mantle travel to it. They multiply by cell division surrounding the injury or irritant to create a closed cyst called a pearl sac. This pearl sac was first discovered in 1856 by a scientist named von Hessling. The cells in the pearl sac began producing the various material layers that will eventually create our pearl. If there is a parasite inside the pearl sac, then it also gets dissolved. Who cares, right? But this distinction is important because it helps industrialize the process. Everyone else was sticking living parasites into the oyster. Once you realize that this is not necessary, you can go about finding what thing you can stick in there to get results like a natural pearl. From the start, Mikimoto wanted to make spherical pearls. That was the goal. He tried inserting a variety of items or nuclei into the oyster in order to stimulate the oyster into creating a pearl sac. He introduced nuclei made from coral, abalone, bone, powdered fish scales, and so on into his oysters. In 1892, Mikimoto hit upon a breakthrough. He created beads from the shells of other oysters, and they formed hemispherical pearls. These are basically half-sphere pearls. Their flat bottoms make it easier for them to stick to settings. The following year, Mikimoto filed a patent and immediately started scaling up his hemispherical pearl operation. He opened a jewel shop in the Ginza district of Japan and started marketing his cultural pearls abroad. Meanwhile, his team continued searching for a way to produce perfectly round pearls. Okay, this is about to get complicated. Mikimoto's second daughter married one of his disciples, a man named Tokichi Nishikawa. In 1901, Nishikawa was in Australia as a fisheries inspector, where he met another inspector, the father-in-law of another scientist named Tatsuhei Mise. The two were probably familiar with the work of an English marine biologist named William Saville Kent. Saville Kent was stationed in Australia at the time and was known for his work in corals. But the guy was also interested in pearls. There are records that from 1890 to 1893, 
Savio Kent conducted experiments in pearl formation in the Torres Strait between New Guinea and Australia. Knowledge and understanding of this pearl work reached the two Japanese and inspired them. In 1902, Nishikawa returned to Japan, as did Mise's stepfather. Mise's stepfather must have told Mise about what he learned in Australia, because Mise immediately began experimenting on pearl cultures in his native Mie prefecture. In 1907, Mise began filing for patents on his procedure. Meanwhile, separately, Nishikawa was secretly working with Mikimoto on spherical pearl culturing too. Mikimoto had moved him to a separate island for secrecy issues. His team eventually operated on 27,000 oysters. In 1905, a red tide swept over Nishikawa's oysters, killing many of them. But miraculously, workers found three spherical pearls in some of the survivors, leading Nishikawa to declare victory. In 1907, he started filing for a patent too. Both methods were very similar, leading to a patent conflict. They both used similar nuclei, a bead and a small piece of mantle tissue called a cybo. This cybo is carefully selected from a different donor oyster and is in secure contact with said bead but does not entirely cover it. This part is critical. The nuclei and cyba would then be implanted into the oysters using specially modified dental tools or a needle. Nishikawa's invention came first, but Mise filed first. The two sides argued for a while but made peace in 1908. Nishikawa was dying from terminal cancer, and Mise decided to settle at a disadvantage to himself, writing in his memoirs, Tokichi Nishikawa is nearing the end of his life due to illness, and this issue must be resolved as soon as possible. Mise was a fine human being, but perhaps not the greatest businessman. Anyway, the two fused their work to create the Mise Nishikawa method. Nishikawa passed away the following year at the age of 35. The rights of his share of the patent passed to his son Shinkichi Nishikawa, Mikimoto's grandson. Meanwhile, work on the Mise Nishikawa method was carried on by Nishikawa's assistants. Sukeo and Masayo Fujita. The Fujita brothers further honed their method. Mikimoto realized that this improved Mise Nishikawa method scaled far better than anything else that he had done before and licensed it in 1916. Mass production began that same year. From there on, Japan's spherical cultured pearls took over the world pearl market. These pearls were far cheaper selling at a third of the price of their natural counterparts, and customers just liked them more. Cultured pearls eventually got to be far larger, consistent, and lustrous than naturals. By 1926, Japan dominated the cultured pearl industry. Mikimoto had the largest and most prominent farm, but there were over 30 farms and 670,000 pearl oysters. By 1931, there were 51 farms producing a million pearls each year. The Gulf pearl fishing industry vanished, smashed to pieces from both the supply and demand sides. On the supply side, Japan's cultured pearls ever scaling in quantity, and on the demand side, the Great Depression snuffing out the market in 1929. It led to massive social upheaval. The pearl divers' debts were never easy to pay off, but now it was impossible. Many turned to the British for arbitration and possible release from their debts. By the 1930s, the captains no longer made money from each pearling trip, so they released the pearl divers entirely. Only the pearl divers, now desperate for work, argued against being thrown out into the metaphorical cold. The governments of the Gulf also saw the annihilation of their pearling revenues. It might have been the end of them, but luckily, they struck oil. Literally. To conclude a quick side discussion, the similarities between Mise and Nishikawa's methods have led historians like C. Dennis George to fervently argue that Seville Kent, the English coral biologist, was the true discoverer of the method. The two Japanese merely took it back home and claimed it as their own. But George's arguments for this are largely circumstantial. We can be sure that Seville Kent did create hemispherical pearls, but spherical pearls? That we are not so sure. There is little documentation of his methods, and he died in 1909. Furthermore, there was little to discover. 
By the early 1900s, the scientific community already largely knew what created natural pearls and even the mechanism by which it happened. Remember, the pearl sack was discovered all the way back in 1856. I am not saying that Seville Kent wasn't the original inventor. I just want to point out that we shouldn't be so quick to say that he was, like as Wikipedia implies. So then you have to ask, if the knowledge was already out there, why were the Japanese the first to capitalize on it? The Japanese first industrialized cultured pearl production because the rest of the world was so busy building their cultured pearl farm operations based on the parasite infection theory. However, Japan's Akoya oysters did not have the same parasites as those in the West, yet they still produce pearls all the same. This was the critical insight that led Japanese scientists and Mikimoto to search for another stimulus of some kind. So in some ways a bit of pure luck, but Mikimoto and the jewelry empire that now bears his name were able to make the most of it to build up one pearl empire and bring down another. Alright everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.